Ian, what do... No, Ryan Stone. I'm, I see he's the most important guy in the world. Ryan Stone. Give a fuck about Ryan Stone. Me and him have gone back and forth. Blah, blah, yeah. blah. Ryan Stone does not pass the six-foot test. He's not even a man. So I don't give a fuck about Ryan Stone. Seventy-nine T twenty-four fifty-eight learning, learning Corp Little Red Riding Hood take one. Ah, oh, there we go. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You guys know all the good stuff. Um, kind of beat up today. Not phoning this one in, but we're going to take it a little easier. I don't know. If you guys haven't followed me on the second channel, like... Dogs got into a fight, and then one of them didn't think, bit me on the thumb, tore it up. It's like, I just have this thing with fingers. <laughs> I don't know. If you guys don't know, that's the, the running... Well, it's not a running joke. It's just something that happened to me when I first moved to Montreal. Take a typical BC hippie. You know, riding my bike to work and a car hit me, took out two of my fingers and they had to reattach it. So that was like my first month in La Belle Provence. So a lot of times when I hate Quebec, that's why. So, yeah. Anyways, uh, we're going to have a fun one today. How are the levels looking? I've been I've been playing around with it because I know a lot of you guys have been complaining about the uh, audio on these things. So I think I think we're good now. Um, welcome to everybody in chat. And this one is going to be about amorality. I was going to do it last week, but uh, obviously we had the 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 Kyla uh, cast on that one. And I mean, it was a learning experience. It was a learning experience, and it really did give me nostalgia vibes for uh, the old purple pill debate stuff, which... Again, if you were never part of that experience, it's just everything everything you've been told about Redditors is true. They're just in people that want to be smart, insufferably so, arguing a lot. But yeah, <laughs> there's Chesty in chat. PPD gives PTSD. So uh, the topic of this one was going to be the amorality of the red pill. Which is actually perfect that Ed Chesty's here on this one because it was something we had talked about before. Uh, there was that guy Ultimate Cad, which I've I've mentioned on the podcast a bunch. If you guys don't know, his basic story is his wife went off behind his back to go have like a dinner or you know hang out a date or whatever with some old fling, lied to him about it, and then he kind of took a cold hard look in the mirror, realized like like I get it, I get why she would do that. Um codependent a fat piece of crap or whatever uh went cold went dark worked out got hot <laughs> and dick was open for business slept with everything in the neighborhood and he used to give field reports all the time talk a lot about probably had one of the strongest frames in the place if for no other reason than every guy in there was so mad at him and half the chicks it was actually the fights between him and kate if you guys remember uh, Kate from Twitter. That's what got the women banned from the place because it's like, just let the man talk, leave him alone. Which is another reason why I brought that up last week. Anyways, so he brought up a good point because everybody's like, why are you sitting here on a forum with a bunch of nerds talking about, you know, your sexual escapades? You're obviously making it up. You know, most guys do. Oh yeah, I've, you know, top G, whatever. Uh, but he kind of he kind of brought it up in a way that made perfect sense. He goes, look, I've basically opened up my marriage on this side, on my side, not hers now, you know, for whatever reason. And it's like, you don't have to accept my reasons are mine and I'm going to do them. So who am I going to tell about this? I can't tell friends and family like a fun anecdote. Hey, remember that time I slept with Buddy's wife? It's like, no, you can't. You can't talk to his wife about it. You know, communication's the key, but maybe not to this extent. So he's like, all I've got is you guys to brag about this stuff to. And I just kind of laughed. I was like, I, I know it's not Rolo's uh, feminine primary social order thing. Like, I don't think it's ever been socially acceptable to talk about all the, the tail you've been plowing <laughs> while your wife's sitting at home. And it was the weirdest thing on it, too, is they is like she had the right amount of dysfunction that that hardcore dread he was putting on 24, 7, 365 was enough to keep her acting right. And it was like 
like I said, that was like seven years ago. I have no idea what it's like now. Maybe they're separated. He did say he wanted to leave, but he wanted to do it on his timeline. He might be waiting for the kids to turn 18. I don't know. Uh, but it was a great source of knowledge. And this is where the amorality part comes from. And again, you've heard this last week, but typical of the internet, if you don't say it 700 times, nobody's going to remember. The amorality of the space listens to these things strictly from a praxeological lens, not from a moral one. And that's important. And like, why is that important? Well, it's important because it's just a tool. The example I used last week, and I'll, I'll use it again here, was um, he was talking about uh, cheating, you know, uh, cheating advice, not asking, giving. And it was something to the effect of uh, like, don't lock your phone. That looks suspicious. There's a lot of apps that have locks on them too. Just do that. It's way easier. Small, uh, minuscule piece of advice. It was hypothetical. Basically, if you don't want to sleep around and cheat on your wife, then it's not really useful to you. But if you do, probably a helpful piece of information. And this was, and this is where Chesty and I were talking before. We're like, this is oh, hiding the glass. <laughs> We'll get to that story too later. But the point is, like, that is really showing you. It, you. Everybody's like, yeah, this place is amoral. Yes. Well, you throw that example out there. All of a sudden, everybody starts, all the trads start coming out of the word work. You know, a real man would just tell his wife what he's doing. And he's like, no, <laughs> no, that's dumb. Why would you tell your wife you're, like, you're, you're cheating on her? And he goes, you lie to her because she wants to be lied to. And if she doesn't want to be lied to, who cares? <laughs> So I don't want to, I don't want her to use this and like take the kids from me. Are you crazy? So it was kind of funny. You know, it's his life, but then everybody just has this thing. I think, how does, oh, I'm actually quoting Rolo twice and it's only like six minutes into this so far. What was that thing he would say where it was, um, people can't understand things except from like a moral filter. Like, tell me how I'm supposed to feel about this. And it was a great example of that. How am I supposed to feel about this? I'm like, you're not supposed to feel anything. You're not supposed to feel anything. You're supposed to look at this situation and think, what is it I can learn from this? And what is this that I can apply from this to my life? Now, some guys obviously wanted to open up their marriages, so they used it. Most guys, though, just didn't want to be cheated on. They wanted a wife that was pleasant and sexually available. The occasional sandwich or heaven forbid dinner. Or they were validation seeking guys who wanted to become more mental point of origin, build up their own frame. And so these things had like gold mines. Gold mines of information. He would tell stories about, you know, fooling around with some chick in the cab who called the family and wished everybody well beforehand. It's like 11 o'clock on a Friday and she's on a business trip. And so a lot of guys are like, hey, that's kind of interesting to know that because there was like this standard thing where if your girl was going to go on a girl's nights out and there's always guys that were like, well, we just have to set up some some boundaries to this and it's fine. You can go on your girl's night out, but send me photos of what you're doing or give me a call before you go to bed so I can hear if there's a guy like, you know, weird shit like that. And then he had this great post. It's like, if she cheats, you'll never know. You'll never know. He's like, I've watched them. They turn into, they turn into Jason Bourne on this stuff. So if she does, she'll never know. So all this stupid dancing around GPS tracker in your car, all that crap, it's not going to matter. And it was like this cold splash of water for a lot of guys. Like what? Uh, one sec. A little ahead of schedule on this one. Making the effort to both do proper clips and to, to properly timestamp these things. For you guys, because it's like the least, it's literally the least I could do. Yeah, so he's like, all this stuff doesn't matter. And you know, it's just one guy, right? It's like one guy saying this, who cares? But then you would start to see other things. Like there was this other guy who was a, a military guy. He was getting deployed. He was terrified. His wife was cheating on him. She was always, you know off doing things and he was always worried about it and he was a little bit on the paranoid side but that's not the point he everybody else was telling him the same stuff like look like if she does you're never gonna know so just live your life stop focusing so much on her focus more on you and if it comes to light that she is doing something then you deal with it and he's like no 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 i'm gonna hire a private he hires a private eye private eye goes does his thing while he's off in in i don't know Brunei, Brunei or somalia so i don't know where so wherever he was deployed Anyway, hey, what's up, Tom? Um, the, the PI comes back, sends him some photos, and you're like, oh, okay, guys. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, you always know a field report's going to be good, where it's like, all right, this is not what I expected. You're like, oh, that's weird. If it's cheating, usually it's like starts off with that bitch or something like that. But So he's like, yeah, it turns out she just 
goes to like a coffee shop, sits quietly and reads books alone. She goes to the movies by herself. She doesn't do anything. And he's like, oh, so it turns out she's not cheating on me. It's just she can't stand to be around me. <laughs> That's so much worse. That's so much worse. But then that's the point, because like this was there was probably like six months of all this cloak and dagger spy stuff. Right. And in that six months, you can do a hell of a lot of work towards your frame. Like if you pick up uh, my book, Praxeology, Volume One Frame, available at good Amazon stores, self-published everywhere. The stuff that's in that book is kind of like a roadmap for most people when they run through the red pill and get their own get build their own frame. Right. Six months is usually plenty enough for like a highly motivated guy who truly like commits to to doing work and fixing his life or at least, you know, pushing it in the right direction. <laughs> Best book since Sanction. Hey, it saved more lives than Sanction, right? Anyway, so yeah, so six months of that. So what did he do? He spent six months with his head up his wife's ass with all this paranoia looking for stuff. Meanwhile, had he just listened to the adulterer... <laughs> He would have realized that's just a waste of time. Go do your workouts. Go get your frame. Go do some catch and release. Learn it like learn how to pick up girls. Maybe use that towards your wife if you want to, but at least be charming to everybody you can because it's a good skill to have. Instead, he'd wasted it on this. So you start to get like, uh, and this is where I talk about emergent evidence, or not emergent evidence. Sorry, uh, uh, convert convergent convergent evidence. So Cat is just one guy telling a story about sleeping with soccer moms, whatever. Now, this guy is given a story about, you know, private eye and how she just didn't want to be around him. And then you kind of start to see, like, everybody's approaching this from a different angle. This guy's the cheating guy. This guy's worried about getting cheated on. Most guys were somewhere in the middle, you know, just wife's acting weird. What's up with that? And then you ask about it and you find out it's just something, whatever. And so all all these different uh, field reports kind of point towards this same direction. Basically, if she's cheating, you're never going to know. The time you spent trying to, to sleuth your way through this is just going to give you uh, paranoid delusions. So you're better off just, again, building your own frame, having a little bit of dread in your life, naturally or otherwise. And if it happens, then you deal with it when you deal with it. And it just it was just a neat how it played out. But here's and here's where... I think girls ruin male spaces, and this is something that I kind of just, I was doing a little bit of research into some of the history stuff here, and it's kind of interesting. It's almost like we have, I'm going to make this its own thing. <laughs> it's going to be that good. Uh, Tinder is red pill. I don't know the title of it. I'm calling it Tinder is red pill. Here's the point. So when online dating first started, and this is going to be, this is going to be an analogy. So online dating first started, everybody was on, was it OkCupid, I think was first, or Plenty of Fish, Plenty of Fish. And then all the attractive people went on it, tried out, everybody had sex, it was great. And then unattractive people start joining up, they're like, oh, this is kind of cool, I can get in there too. And now you're just like, oh, I got to scroll through fours. And then eventually it dilute, it goes into like, all oh, you got are like fat poly chicks. And you're like, oh, okay, this is done. All those people, what did they do? They went to OkCupid and the same thing. It used to be like the initial adopters, attractive people, lots of sex. It was so much fun. The uh, goes like, hey, I can get laid. Everybody else is getting laid and they come in and they ruin the site. And so there's this constant cat and mouse game where attractive, sexually promiscuous people are going from app to app to app, build it up, make it successful. And then unattractive people with money to spend go in there and ruin it for everybody. And the cycle's getting faster. Supposedly... It's gone from like four or five years to like 18 months now. I don't know what it is. For all I know now, it could be like six months process. Like, dude, you guys are naming off dating sites faster than I can keep up. I know about Tinder, Bumble, and Hinge, but I hear there's like a bunch of new ones now. So the reason I say this is because the original group of men was like in the 70s, the men's rights advocates, where feminism was doing great for women. Men are getting left behind. You know, guys like Herb Goldberg and Esther Villar, basically disenfranchised feminists and male feminists were like, hey, what about us? To which the feminists said, shut up. <laughs> anyway, so the men's rights are kind of advocating for themselves. And then all of a sudden, you know, women start to get in because they're sympathetic. You know, the pick me girl syndrome. Hey, guys, I agree. And I'm not saying these girls are bad people. Not at all. Like Karen Strawn, I love her work. But it got to the point where a bunch of guys would start to like, and if it was ever a male grievance that was at the expense of women, we're not even talking about like 
online misogyny or anything like that. Like this is eighties and nineties stuff where the guys were just like, Hey, you know, paternity fraud is bad or whatever. And then the girls would shut that shit down. Cause look, like we're all for men's rights and advocation, but not at the expense of women. Cause women always prefer, they always have an in-group loyalty to women that men just don't have towards themselves. And then uh, a group of guys got so disenfranchised about that. They're like, that's it. We're going to, they started their own thing. MGTOW, men going their own way. That was literally what it was, leaving the men's rights. And they, there was some disenfranchised pickup artists too. But for the most part, it was just women ruined the MRA space. So they went to MGTOW. Uh, Sean Bipley, sir. Thank you for the $99.99 super chat. Again, the, the silent protector. Thank you very much, sir. F's in the chat, or I guess, what's the what's the opposite of F's in the chat? Give that to him. Yeah, Doc, you gotta say something. Anyways, so then they came into MGTOW, and then MGTOW kind of started to get women invading it, so then they went to Black Pill and Incel and all that shit. And I know this is like some weird internet thing. I get it, it's super niche, but the point is there's like a dynamic at play here. And those guys eventually, and eventually you get through all of these different little sub-niches, and it's just rebranded the same thing. And now it's at the Red Pill iteration. And you're seeing the red pill now, again, invaded by women. And you're seeing women like, uh, like what's the new one? And there's no hate on this one. It's like, I wish her all the best. But Pearly was talking with, what the hell is that guy's name? The kid who doesn't believe in the Holocaust. <laughs> I don't even know. And she's talking about the red pill this. And she's like, yeah, come on, see the pregame show with that guy and Sterling. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> it just reminded me of that Simpsons episode where they're like, nuts and gum together at last. So it's like this this space is is not long. And I think the best we can do now is some kind of cultural anthropology and pick up a lot of the lessons. And again, now that women have kind of invaded this space, it's going to be increasingly moralized. Increasingly moralized. And you're going to lose a lot of what's available. So I would suggest get, get in now while the getting is good. Get in now while the getting is good. So let's give it a little bit more uh, lighthearted stuff here. Um... Oh, what the hey, Walshy. I don't usually post pictures of my kids online, but they're infants and you can barely see them, so, you know, it's, it's fine. But a YouTuber named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone tweeted, showing off the F trophies for clout. <laughs> so the babies are trophies that I'm showing off. It's perhaps not a surprise that a picture of a proud father would be so upsetting to the sort of man who clearly never had one. So the reason it's no longer going to be amoral soon, and it's not just women. There's a, there's like, I use women as like, a, what is a woman? Well, yeah, it's, sometimes it's like guys who act effeminate enough, like the 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 trad guys, the uh, the the sis, the the husband wives, the uh, what the hell's the name for it? I can never remember. They call it something like servant leaders or something. Essentially. I, I, I look at it like a Frank Fazetta painting. If you guys don't know, Frank Fazetta is in the 1980s. He did all the Dungeons and Dragons stuff. And it was pretty cool. It was basically oiled up, muscular dudes with oiled up, naked chicks. And there was this one genre of painting where it was hot chicks with like a, a dumb beast that they're controlling. And that's basically what the men raised this defective women thing is. You know? <laughs> So once you start getting women in spaces, this is how it kind of works because they're they're advocating for themselves. Women don't care about abstract concepts as as like group, as groups. So if you have like a hunting party, guys treat the hunting party as this is the place where you go to hunt. You're in here, you're here to hunt. Women join it and they're like, I get to be the leader of the hunting party. The hunting is 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 relevant. It's only there so you have something to talk about because women. That's the big thing about um, female social hierarchies is it's always about using power without looking like you're losing power that's why they always play play dumb on these kind of things it's because they have to as soon as you look like you're trying to win that's when all the other girls crab bucket drag you down so you have to look like it's an accident you just slipped and fell <laughs> i just slipped and fell into the ceo position that's why their solution to things is always to like nag and just articulate the problem hoping that men sort it out because then it's like i didn't do it he did it i'm i'm just i'm just here running things i don't know So the amorality takes a back seat. And again, I posted uh, an old, old whisper article about this where he talks about why purple pill debate or like why men and women arguing in a co-ed space about sexual strategy, especially for men's benefit, is not useful at all. Other than for entertainment. 
it's fun. Oh yeah, women and men yelling at each other. Uh, it's always good times, but you're not arguing about the same things. You're not bringing the same, uh, the same axioms, I guess, the same axioms or premises to, to what you're trying to do. And ultimately your strategies differ because of that. So for guys, it's, you know, it's not even accountability. I, I refuse to use that stupid buzzword because it's like, it's such a crude marketing term. Because accountability sounds good to men, but that's not what's going on. They're absolutely accountable. They're just on a whole different level. You're, you're trying to judge a, a fish by how well it rides a bicycle. So obviously from the red pill side of things, you want to find objective, objective facts. Facts are something, truth from a red pill lens is something that happens that you can predict that you can use to make better decisions with. Something is more true if it has better predictive power. It's a good way to look at it. I'm not going to get into the philosophical, well, what is truth? I'm not Jordan Peterson. I'm not uh, Sam Harris. I don't want to waste your time. So for us in the red pill, on the red pill side of things, if you're adopting the framework well enough, it's okay. So this piece of information I get, is it useful for me? The cat thing? Absolutely useful for me. If a girl's cheating on you, he's showing you exactly what it's like from the other side of things with a male honesty that just doesn't exist. Women will do something called trickle truth. If they did cheat on you and they do get caught, they will start admitting the smallest parts and they will like, you have to fight to get every ounce of whatever. And if they can lie, they'll lie. If they can, you know, steal, they'll steal. They'll be honest if they have to. It's called trickle truth. But the guy's like, yeah, dude, he's bragging about it. So of course he's going to be honest. Like, why would he need to make shit up? I mean, some guys do, but in this case, we're, it's a, it's a pretty honest one. So that's, that's useful. That's great. And now that you understand it's useful, but then there's like the moral angle. So what's the, the red pilled moral angle? Well, it's, you know, morality is subjective. Things are good or things are bad. You know, uh, what do they say? Murder is wrong, but war is good. As long as it's against somebody you don't like. Self-defense is good. Well, I thought killing was wrong. Well, yeah, but he tried to kill you first. Well, is it wrong or is it not wrong? Well, that depends. Exactly. It's good for you or it's bad for them or it's bad or good for them and bad for you. But there's always a winner and a loser. That's the whole point of morality. Who comes out ahead? Who comes out behind? So you take the idea of like an objective truth. You know, things are predictive and useful. And then you take it and apply it to a moral filter of is this good for me or is this bad for me? If you guys read philosophy and I hope you don't, I hope you don't. There's uh, Nietzsche where he talks about master and slave morality. And I'm pretty sure Marcus Aurelius talks about... Uh, self-love it's kind of like similar but anyways whatever oh it is a sign of no remorse jay but that's put that as put a pin in that one for now um so you take those two things you put them together and what do you get you get guys that are here discussing you know strategies basically how do we get more useful truths right things are good things are bad so it doesn't really matter about the person's moral character Cad's cheating on everybody, cheating on his wife so much. It's like, well, so is what he's saying any good? And you're like, yeah, it's actually pretty useful. I'm like, good enough. You're in the club. I mean, I'm not saying he's in the club, but he's. it's just like you're in the club. Women, on the other hand, you know, it's always my truth. Truth to the generalized feminine whatever. I always hate how I have to preface this with some, like, I'm not like, I, I get it. Not everybody is like this. That's not the point my truth it's like a codified set of ex of somebody's personal experience is truth and that's a solipsism thing if you guys don't know solipsism is the idea that the only thing exists is you and everything else is just a projection based on you something like that I, i'm fudging the terms but it doesn't matter anyways so that's truth now morality is oh no there is a moral standard of course it's always the person's moral standard who's speaking solipsistic moral standard things are good or bad. And there's a reason that women and autists always have that same attitude of get new information, be told how to feel about it, and then reject it or accept it at face value. That's it. I don't know what it is about autism, but it has that one feminine trait to it, you know? Uh, back to that. <laughs> She's sleeping underneath me. I was going to set up the dog cam, but I'm like, eh, it's too much to put it underneath my feet. Seem like to a bunch of electrical cables. Um, so you get... So it's like, if there's only one type of morality, what does that mean? Well, that means whoever has the status, whoever's on top of the hierarchy, 
Remember that hierarchy we were talking about before? Those are the people that set the moral standard. That's literally followership, you know? That's why, that's how, and it's just, it's, it's hypergamy. That's how hypergamy works. Women are attracted to one man, one man at a time. They start to mirror his his beliefs and that. Remember what I tell you guys before? Like if if a girl's really into you, she'll start to like you things you like. She'll start to pick up the hobbies you pick up. She'll start to listen to the music you listen to. Picture that, but for a girl who doesn't like a man, but she is caught on to like feminism or some other hypergamous best option, politics, feminism, whatever. Now they start to adopt that moral framework and that becomes the moral framework. And at that point, the, the arguments for the, from them and their lens is who's at the top of this fuck pile so that they can set the moral framework, which they've already set up. And that's how you get situations where girls are basically, that's wrong and everything is about status. It doesn't mean it's that literally you being an asshole or not and your character is the only thing on the table with the argument. The actual things you're arguing about is just a mechanism to get there. So when you get men and women, you got, in this case, the red pill guy is saying morality is subjective and then the the feminine side is like well yeah but facts don't matter <laughs> so that's why it wastes this time and so this is why you cannot have a co-ed space and an amoral sexual strategy because it just doesn't work so every time i see you guys like look i love podcasting with ali every now and again she's a lot of fun torsha when she shows up same thing the other girl i mean some of the other girls i do on there like uh chrissy mayer was fine too but you just got to remember that that is not red pill and you fundamentally have to approach these things from a different lens. And this is something that Ian Ironwood talked about uh, a lot. One sec. When he talks about the social matrices or social matrices. There it is. The, the male and the female social matrix or social matrices. And there's a co-ed one too. And so as a guy, if you want to become socially savvy, you have to kind of learn how to navigate all three of them. You know, flow in and out seamlessly. Obviously, if you're around just the guys, you can deal with things in one way. Conflict is handled a certain way. Status is sorted out a certain way. If it's all women, again, different ways of doing it. If you're in a co-ed space, depending. Like, obviously, there's now a point where a lot of guys just completely surrender to the feminine imperative. And so those co-ed spaces essentially become feminine spaces. But there used to be co-ed spaces with men and women. There was actually a great, um, was it Athol K.? Married Man Sex Life Primer on his forums there. It was like, what to do when the other man challenges you first? And obviously some guy just kept emasculating. The guy, guy was hosting a barbecue, had his wife there. And some third tier guy, I don't know who he is, just started like harping on him, you know, amogging him or whatever. Making fun of him. Oh, yeah, is your wife let you do that or whatever. And he just kind of laughed it off because... If as soon as you start getting into that like barking match and you start puffing out your chest and giving like the 50 cal finger and somebody's there, it it comes across as aggressive and violent. And in a co-ed space, women hate any like aggressive stuff. And in a guy space, you don't care. Guys are going to be right nose to nose arguing about it. Five minutes later, they're fine. Maybe a fist fight happens. They'll have a drink after the fist fight. It's all sorted out. But with a co-ed space, that stuff doesn't fly. It ends up like the girls try turning their husbands on the group. They don't come back from barbecues. It's not a sustainable strategy. So in this case, the guy uh, was just doing his thing, but he had a really good friend with him who just kind of like privately took a guy to the side. It's like, look, if you ever come back here, I'm going to beat the piss out of you. And then that's it. So you do it quietly. You do it subtly. You let the guy know. The guy starts trying to play stupid, whatever. I mean, it's, it's a good one. If I can find it, like I said, he's, he's deleted all of his stuff because of his... Uh, But again, amorality is the only way you can kind of learn this stuff. Because you, can, you can't talk to a girl. It's like, hey, if you're at a barbecue and somebody starts emasculating me in front of you and trying to hit on you when I'm not there, what do I do about it? And she'll probably say something like, well, just blah, blah, blah. Talk about it. Talk about it. Talk about it. Because that's what girls do. They talk. Men do. And then as soon as you start talking about the way men do things, that's different than their morality. And so they're like, no, that's wrong. That's bad. That's evil. You should really let him put his dick in your wife. And then just have a, have a stern talk to him and, and ex express your feelings. It's like, no, it's not going to work. Basically, if he tries to make a pass at your wife, you're going to beat the crap out of him. But you're going to have the courtesy at the barbecue not to ruin everybody's day by doing it in front of him. Don't do it at the boat, at the banquet, at banquet or yeah, banquet table. I'll do it in the, in the driveway. And you guys can just ask like, oh, he had to go. <laughs> That's all you got to say. 
So yeah, you need like you need like an amoral space like this. And it sucks now because everybody is so atomized that the only way a lot of you guys have, like maybe maybe I don't know, you guys will tell me. Some of you guys have it, some of you guys don't. But for a lot of guys, especially younger guys, and it's getting increasingly worse is they have to learn about this stuff from a book. Like they don't have friends, groups. I got I was blessed in the military because we had like a you know a good solid group of about 20 different guys all in relationships or single so we got to kind of experience a lot of this stuff firsthand but for a lot of guys you know went to college got a programming job they don't see more than three people ever so excuse me so yeah they have to like learn this stuff from a book and now here's the thing how do you know which one is right because obviously, if you take a guy who doesn't know anything and you start implying, like, here's this kind of stuff you need to learn. Who's the most popular message on that right now? It's, uh, it's Cancer Boy. Cancer Boy Tater. It's like, yeah, if a guy ever does this, just run him over with your bigotti. And everybody's like, no, that sounds good. So in the land, in the land of the, of the autistic, the, the marketer is king. Yeah. Sam Whiskey, thank you, sir. $4.99 super chat. If she brings a new skill to the bed. It means she learned it from another man. It's okay as long as he's not German. The French adjudant. <laughs> Who's the French lawyer? That's funny. Um, I mean, yeah, when it comes to cheating, that's one thing. If you start seeing, like, radical changes in behavior instantly, that's a red flag, obviously. But with everything, you have to put it into context. One single red flag isn't a big issue. But if you start seeing eight or nine, and they're all pointing in the same direction, it's the same as, it's the same as I just talked about with Convergent Evidence with CAD. One guy running his mouth about cheating is not going to change everything. But you get 50 people talking about it from different angles and different approaches, and it all leads to the same place. That gives you an idea that maybe you're onto something. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and Zay, Zay's kind of right here. Like, you, you should never be 100% surprised about this stuff. That's the one thing to be very, very cautious for. And this is always one of the easiest ways. The easiest way to suss out somebody who knows what he's talking about versus somebody who's making shit up is to have some experience. It's the easiest way. Like, there was other guys, they would brag about this, that, and the other thing. And there was always something that seems off about it. So that's another thing that's good about the amoral space. You get guys that do these things. You get guys that experience these things. You get guys that talk about these things. So when you see... A blowhard just running his mouth because he wants to sound cool, who's got no experience and his advice is absolute garbage. Everybody who has even like a little bit of experience in that space will always be like, I'm not sure I buy that. Like, I'm not, this isn't making sense to me. This is not how things go. And then as you start to notice, because a good story that's outside of your experience, but, you know, still has enough relatability to it, like 20%, 30%, you're like, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then they kind of have that leap of faith that goes afterwards. It, it makes it more palatable. Like, obviously, there's degrees of trust you want to give to sexual strategies. Until you have, like, 100 people saying the same thing, you're probably not, uh... Yeah, my suspicion confirmed. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Andy, too. Amoral is important. I hope you keep at this. We appreciate it. Like I said, don't worry about appreciating it. Just, uh, just sort out your life. I get, I actually get, and this is like a little brag on my part, whatever. I earned it. There's a lot of times where I'll get like successful people, somewhat famous, somewhat successful, definitely bigger than me. And they're like, dude, thank you so much. This helped for this, this helped for that. I wish one day we can live in a world where I can actually like your tweet and have it pop up on my Twitter page. I'm like, hey, don't sweat it. That's another one of the big jokes as to why it's like, he's like, he looks like really under, under, undervalued, like critically, criminally undervalued was like the joke. And it's not that this stuff isn't bigger. It's just that it's underground. So it's literally the, I'm like literally the porn mags underneath the, the mattress. And that's, I know that's dating myself as a reference. If you guys don't know, back when porn came in magazine form, the thing is kids would take it and hide it in between their mattress and box spring. Cause then that's the one place the parents wouldn't look. Mom always found it, but dad would always tell her to shut up and just leave it there. Yeah. Well, Doug Chisholm, sir, also. Uh, one sec here. Doug Chisholm, thank you for the $99.99 super chat. Oh, thank you. That would have been 50 cuck articles. <laughs> Frame was a good read. I came to this space in 2020 and had a consult with you. Life-changing. 
I gained understand. That's a while back, by the way. That's crazy. It's crazy how long it's been. I gained understanding that I was not taught as a young man. I was able to teach my son. He has implemented the information well. Breaking old cycles and beginning new ones. Thank you, dude. Thank you. Honestly, I'm just, I'm glad you liked it. I've, I've been trying my best not to spend a whole two hours talking about all the little things about the book that uh, I worked really hard that's like subtextual to help things with you. It just seems like it's too much ego for me, but damn it, you're tempting me to on this one. But yes, thank you. Look at that. See, that's the beauty of this too, right? When like when you start getting your life together, you get your frame, you get your mental point of origin, you understand the dynamics of the world, you make better choices. It's not just that it helps you. Like imagine if Doug was sitting here, let's say hypothetically, Doug is just some, you know, ah, whatever, doesn't really do anything, but he listens to some podcasts. And then he's like, hey, Rolo, remember that? Like, what age should I give him your book? And Rolo, I think Rolo and I always have the same answer. It's like, dude, you shouldn't be giving him something to read. You should be like teaching him. And the best way to teach him is to exemplify something. Because they, they don't care what you say. Kids don't give a shit. Kids watch you, though, and they learn how to act by watching how you act. So, And this is always one of those things that bug me. I'm going to make a title on this called Doug and Fatherhood. Because Doug's going to be a good example from this one. Doug and fatherhood. So all these guys want to offload the responsibility. They always think like, you know what? I've made some bad choices, but my son's going to be better than me. And not realizing that everything he learned, he learned by watching you. And so they always want to give the kid that one book. They want to give the kid the one vacation. They want to hook the kid up with the one thing that can help him out. When it's like the best thing you can do is be a good example for him. But that's hard. That takes work. You could potentially fail. And sometimes you're going to piss your kids off because they don't know. They don't know anything. So they see you doing stuff that works. Like, I don't know anybody who's an adult today who hasn't had that moment where they look back at something their dad did or stepdad did or whoever, their mom's boyfriend did, and didn't go, at the time, I fucking hated that. But you know what? Like, I get it. I get it. <laughs> you sometimes have to accept that long tail where guys will, kids will hate you. And then once they become an adult, it's like, yeah, I kind of get it. <laughs> yeah, true. My middle son said I learned it from watching you. Yeah. And that's always the, the funniest part. Like, you see a lot of them. Like, I remember there was the LDS Mormon guys. They were talking about, like, hey, if you are if you wanted to, like, break through the, the, like, all the stuff that your dad did to raise you that you didn't like or whatever. And if you wanted to make sure your son never had to experience that, what should you do? And I remember this. I always answer that one with, like, uh, just do what your dad did. It worked out for him. And you're like, that's ah, cynical and jaded. It's like, is it really? Like, there's a certain, I don't I don't want to say narcissism, but I can't think of a better word for it right now attached to it where a guy's thinking is like, yeah, my dad sucked. He did all of these things that I hated, but I managed to plow through and become a better person because of it. They haven't had that, like, I get it now. They haven't had that I get it now moment. And so they think their children aren't nearly as strong as them. It's like, oh, he, I could do it, but there's no way my kid could. So I need to coddle him and teach him in the nice way, the way I wish I'd been taught. Basically, I want him to feel better about everything, but still get to the same place I did over stuff that I didn't feel good about. It's just not going to work that way. It really isn't. And again, they can call it like some black pill nihilistic thing, but like I said in, uh, in Frame, in the one section talking about the oak, is that uh, trees don't grow without wind. You know? They don't. Oh, look at that. Everybody's chilling for a bit. Yeah, they don't. It was actually, that was actually one of the funny things. I don't know how that research came in. It was something to do with Nature Magazine. Oh, I remember why. Because I was looking up the, doing the research of the part where like objective reality doesn't exist. Like our minds aren't designed to objectively understand reality. It's always about symbols, symbols and narratives. And then at one point they were talking about uh, trees. And it's like, is he rambling about trees? Yes, but it matters. And they were doing biodomes you know the biodomes where they want to create like a fake earth and have a totally sustainable ecosystem and there's no wind in it because it's not that big and trees they were noticing dude trees are going faster and taller everywhere in these in these domes here maybe we can use some of this technology to make wood grow in like 10 years as opposed to 100 years and logging and regrowth and reforestation would be great but what they found out is that the trees were weak and they were just falling over it turns out that once you start applying stresses to the tree as a defense mechanism, it builds a different type of uh, collagen, I think it's called, 
that reinforces the tree's structure and makes it stronger and able to stand there. That's how you go like to swamps. You know those ones where you see trees that have their roots exposed and they're hanging like 45 degrees out, but they're holding steady? Yeah, there's like a certain type of growth, but that growth only happens when it's when it's uh, exposed to the stresses of the environment. Basically wind, rain, that sort of thing. And if you don't, then it doesn't need to spend that much energy building these reinforcing structures and it just grows as fast and as hard as possible. Problem is, it gets big enough and they, they crumble against their own weight. Now, this is about men, obviously. Yeah. See, and Doug's right here too. It's like not knowing an answer, but then you get to research and learn. And I think a lot of people mistake that when guys like Rolo or me or any of the Rule Zero guys like Paul or Thor, or whoever, when they're talking about like there's no prescriptive advice, it's because it's not, this isn't dear fucking Abby, you know? What this is, is a framework to use to navigate the world. Like there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of strategies, there's a bunch of theories, there's a bunch of field reports in various stages of, of, of I would argue, completion. And they help you make better decisions. But the idea is, it's not so much that all we have to do is figure out every scenario that a man will ever go through and then everything is solved. No, it's every one of these scenarios follows a very simple roadmap. A bunch of guys get together with a similar problem. They swap notes about the things they tried and the various efficacies they had. And as it goes on, the guy's strategies that had more beneficial effect that more men like the end results of tend to stick around and get reinforced through more and more field reports than guys who have ones that don't work or ones that are cautionary tales. And eventually it gets to the point where there's enough of them together that somebody can pick a narrative structure out of the thing. And that's where you get your theories. So like the iron rules of Tomasi, you guys know those, the seven iron rules of Tomasi. Those are all basically field reports. Guys, guys trying to get back with their ex. 100 guys did that. 100 guys talked about how it was probably a mistake. And Rolo just noticed that and eventually went, I don't know why my nose is so itchy here. It's like I'm doing coke. <laughs> Notice like hundreds of guys having this exact same experience. He's like, all right, rule, uh, rule seven. Don't root through the trash. He makes a narrative structure. You guys know what it means to root through the trash like a dumpster diver. Obviously, as a man, you don't want to be dumpster diving. It means you're poor. That's why you have to get food out of the garbage can. So you don't want it. And, and you kind of intuitively understand that. Now, you may not have read all hundred of those guys field reports about, you know, getting back together with their exes, but the theory is catchy. It's, it's, it's catchy. It's, it's easy. It's easy to remember. It's easy to keep in your head as a narrative structure. As soon as your ex starts calling up, Hey, WYD, what you doing? You're just like, uh, rooting through the trash. And maybe you call her like, you know, trash or whatever, or call her a rule seven or, you know, all these catchy things. And it helps you make better decisions without having to. 100% analyze with extreme rigor every situation in your life. Now, I would argue the difference between something like the red pill, a praxeology, and every other ideology, like with what would Jesus do and stuff like that, is that it's always based on what you can replicate. Science can't even say that anymore, which is crazy. When I was when I was a kid, I remember that. As soon as they started talking about the Big Bang and a new theory, you're like, holy crap, they're discovering everything. We're going to have flying taxis in four years fucking know it what do they got now they got taxis that run over kids <laughs> i was like took a bit of a took a bit of a turn there i didn't see that one coming yeah took a bit of a turn but the practice but yeah it, it worked well for christians earlier on because i'm sure there was a whole bunch of like practical examples of why the good samaritan is a good parable for christians in an agra agrarian bronze age society absolutely Worked well through the Middle Ages. Eventually got all the way to the point where the Industrial Revolution has. It's not so much useful anymore. Now, Christianity's kind of got this weird crisis of faith that's been happening for the last 150, 200 years. Will they sort it out? I don't know. I know there's a lot of people that are invested in wanting it sorted out, but there's also a lot of people that are invested in just, like, sticking their head in the sand, getting those tithes coming in and preaching about, uh, preaching about get the women. Get the women back in the back in the kitchen. And the women are like, no. And he's like, all right. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, who knows? Okay, so moving on from this one. Let's do let's do some more goofing around. Who are we gonna make fun of? Oh, we gotta do this. Oh wait, that's the wrong one. I keep missing that one up. Stead. Yeah, let's do steady. You wanna tell me why the majority of people that voted yes I can be submissive are men? Just want to talk a little bit about why I love women. And the majority that said no are women? 
I would love y'all to ponder that for a fucking second. I love how you know, they always make sure, by and large, they shower. The feminine energy that that girls put out, it's just, it's magnetic. You think I can be submissive? You fuck I adore it. <laughs> the chick's from Vancouver, OnlyFans page. She was famous from, if you guys haven't seen it, there's a Red Pill Coffee video I put out, one of my old ones, where she broke her phone that her boyfriend gifted her because he said, if you want to start dating, and I'm not going to date a girl with an OnlyFans account, and then she just lost her mind, and then she literally twerked in front of a mirror for like 64 seconds, and I was like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just at the time when I started doing ads for the channel, I thought that was just hilarious. And then Stedman had his whole why I love women thing. And I'm like, I should just put these together and add some ominous unsolved mysteries music to it. So that's the, that's the, we're, we're building an iceberg here, fellas. We're building an iceberg. Uh, okay. So next up is, oh yeah. Back to the immorality. Let's fix that timestamp. So back to the morality is like, how do you leave your morals at the door? When you hear a new piece of information, a new field report, a new experience. And it's hard. It really is. Like, I don't know if there is a way to do that other than being zeroed out. Other than being zeroed out. Because it's just, we're not wired for it, man. We're really not. Guys, our brain, well, not just guys, but human beings in general are very lazy as a species because you have to be. If you lived in the savannah, if there was hardly anything to eat, unless you, like, if you had to eat anything, you had to basically run with it for eight hours until it finally passed out from exhaustion and stab it. Then you had to learn how to cook it. Then you had to learn how to eat it. Then you had to fight with the tribe over who got the biggest cut of meat and you had to get whatever. Basically, the people that ate the least and did the least amount of exertion, unless they absolutely had to, survived and thrived. So our brains adapt to this by that fast and slow twitch thinking thing. Uh, type 1 and type 2 thinking, I think they call it, where the, the type 1 is something new and you have to process it. So you have to think through it, you have to plan, you have to practice and test and all this stuff, and then you eventually get something that works. Once you get something that works, you're not going to do that every time. Imagine every time you had to hunt, you had to analyze wind speed and all this stuff. It's like, no, 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 your brain just has like a, it has like a good enough instinctive fast twitch type of thought that handles it. It's like, no, just... Pretend, pretend you're throwing a spear and like, just like go with motor memory, right? Same thing with women. When women are attracted to a man, that's why pre-selection is such a big thing because it takes a lot of effort for a girl to see, is he lying? Is he trustworthy? Is he attractive? Is he going to stick around? Will he provide, you know, all that stuff that girls want, supposedly I've heard, I don't know. According to the podcast, all they want now is a guy with feelings. Feelings are a dick. I don't know. Sometimes both. So what they do is like, oh, this other girl likes them. They're basically leapfrogging off of her expenditure of, of energy in deciding that this guy's worth keeping. And she's like, well, how bad can he be? And that's why, uh, who's that stupid comedian? The one who looks like uh, Curious George the monkey? That's why he gets all these chicks. Because one chick likes him. They're like, oh, how bad can he be? Well, maybe I'll date him too. And then it builds on itself. That's another reason why it's, it's always good to leave women better than you find them. Because... Yesterday's one night stand is tomorrow's cheerleader for you. If you do it right. You gotta remember, like, what would I treat these hoes any good? It's like, well, those hoes are gonna be your biggest supporters. They're the ones that are gonna cheerlead you to the next girl. Even if they bitch about you. Like, dude, people think, like, if a girl starts bad-mouthing you to other women, then that's a bad thing. Girls know that women bitch. And they just complain. And they love complaining. It's like, oh, it's a sport. It's a national sport of woman, woman Asia. Plain. Competitive complaining. And so when she sees this chick complaining about you, oh, he's, just, he's this, he's this, he's this, he's horrible, he's horrible. There's like a subtext to it. Now, sometimes it's obviously bad. Yeah, he beat me or whatever. And they may be like, mm, that's not my thing. But a lot of times it's like, dude, she must have really liked him to be this angry that he rejected her. I wonder what this is all about. And they'll, they'll try it out. I'll try it out. <laughs> Yeah, this would make sense why the military makes you feel stressed during basics so you get that fight or flight response to learn. Well, that's... Th I'm surprised they never told you this, man. When I was in basic, they flat out told you that, like... And I don't know why they told us. It would have been better if we just kind of accidentally discovered it, but, like, we are going to yell at you. We're going to deprive you of sleep. 
We're going to give you tasks and nothing you do is going to be good enough. And we're doing this because you need to separate tone from content. When somebody's yelling and screaming at you, you need to be able to pick out the information in there. And if that's any, any good for you, right? And yeah, they're just yelling at you about your boots. It's almost like manufactured outrage, manufactured stress. And you're dead tired too, so you just kind of put up with it. And eventually, and everybody, a lot of like the, the goofy progressive types are like, ah, oh, it's brainwashing. It's like, it's not brainwashing. It's hardening you the fuck up, man. It's relaxed. It's a good thing. Okay, they did tell you the same thing. Yeah. So when you get all this stuff together, it's, you kind of realize, okay, so these people can be cheerleading for you. And this is how you, like, you leave the morality at the door. But a lot of guys don't like this. That's and that's the point of this. Like the how do you how do you turn off your morals for your own benefit here? And that's what being zeroed out is. Zeroed out is and I hate using the word, but it's it's apt here from a clinical sense. It is a trauma that creates a fight or flight existential threat, perceived, not necessarily real, a perceived fight or flight existential threat which causes guys to stop using their their type 2 fast twitch like uh instinctive thinking and actually what's called increased neuroplasticity and this allows you to start looking and analyzing things again basically developing a new set of this is what i call mental models the narrative structures that we kind of like use as instinct i've yet to see a way to do it the best i've come up with and i, I talk about it constantly is the killology thing you just practice until you don't even think about it you kind of bypass the whole moral aspect of it and this is where i love how the red pill does its thing there where it's all right just um don't worry about the morality just learn what you need to learn and then once you're applying this in your own life apply your morality then but for the learning aspect doesn't matter if the uh if the nazis are going to teach you about hypothermia that's great take all of that knowledge but when you go into the water just know bring you one of them sass suits and don't go diving in the arctic thinking it's fun you know what i mean how many times have women said, I don't like your tone? I think that's the national anthem of Woman Stan. Of Woman Stan, yeah. Well, it was Officer Basic, so they started by not hating us a little bit. Oh, yeah. Officer Basic, whatever. You could tell me all cool shit. It's like, here's, here's your steward, cadet. <laughs> like, fuck off. <laughs> Officer Basic. Let me teach you how to do sword drill. It's like, oh, my brother in Christ. <laughs> Yeah, makes me laugh. So yeah, there's it, the only way to uh, to adopt a new moral standard in your own life is basically some kind of zeroing out. And for a lot of guys, and this is not easy. Like I said, everybody's, what's your rite of passage? Everybody thinks there's need to be some rite of passage to turn from a teenager into a man or something like that. It's like, how about this? How about to turn from a, a 39-year-old married dude to a 40-year-old divorced dude? There's your rite of passage. Get through that without suck starting a shotgun, you know? So yeah, it's a lot of guys. They think they have the perfect life. The wife loves me. The kids love me. I've got this wonderful family. I got friends. I got a good job. Wife starts divorcing. She wants the kids. She starts pulling some Machiavellian shit, accuses them of domestic violence, emotional abuse or something. The friends take her side. The family sometimes takes her side. You know, sometimes that stress causes him to act out in his job and then he gets fired from that. And all of a sudden the guy just realizes my entire life was a lie. Because all this girl had to do is decide she didn't want me to have it anymore, and it's gone. She poisons the kids, parental alienation. The kids hate me. My parents ha love her. They hate me. My friends all abandoned me. So a guy isn't just losing his wife. He's losing his worldview. He's losing every mental model he had that got him to this point. Because they were all just at the behest of a woman. And I know guys hate hearing this, but it's like, dude, sometimes, sometimes... You have to just accept that, like, it's not yours, it's just your turn, you know? Everybody likes calling that some kind of weird nihilistic thing, but it's just, look, I didn't make the rules. You don't get to, and this is one of those ones, I want to make a full show on this one time, where it's, uh, you, you don't get to have kids, you get to sire children, which is probably one of the most hard-to-accept red-pilled, uh, I don't want to say principles, but red-pilled mental models, I guess. Because it's true. Women, and you'll see a lot of women kind of slip up and they always talk about whenever it's the kids doing something wrong, it's always your kids. But whenever the kids are just like talking about their kids generally, it's always my kids. Whenever they're doing something wrong, it's our kids. You need to handle our kids. Whenever they're like great kids, it's my kids. And then you realize women like take, take an ownership of them, which 
whatever they can do whatever they want but that's the problem is that in the court cases at least i mean it's getting better but we're not anywhere yet to where i would start changing the mental model where default people would normally give them to the mom like a mom has to be basically a crackhead a con a, a crackhead murderer until they won't give kids and even then the theranos chick the elizabeth holmes she's popping out kids right now to try and beat out her jail sentence and it's kind of working it's kind of working meanwhile tate's out there parading every every two-year-old he can find he's like oh, this is my two-year-old shave the kid's head so it looks bald <laughs> gives the kid a cigar see can't charge me i got a kid and the judge is like fuck off but holmes you might get off of it oh he's dropping nuggets i think that's a is that a poop joke same thing so like if uh if a girl accuses you of domestic violence or like abusing the kids it's not a case of well let's find out if this is right this is we ought to immediately assume this is true and then you can prove yourself innocent by following all these things so but you can't do that if you say oh i think the wife beating the kids it's a much harder barrier to process because people just don't want to accept it so yeah as it stands now and i'm not saying this is in like hate your kids this is where that stupid idiot that I was making fun of on a Manosphere Mornery took that. And I always hate when people take it as this autistic ramp it up to 12. It just means there's no hard power in this situation. As a guy, you just have to accept that. Well, it shouldn't. Yes, yeah, should. Whatever. Shit in one hand, wish in the other, see which fills up first. So, like, how do you how do you raise a family when you are basically get to be a father at the whims of mom? Well, obviously, you got to persuade mom that it's in her best interest to keep you around. How do you do that? I don't know. Try being attractive. That helps. Well, what about being a good dad and changing diapers? I'm like, that helps too. Early on, those first five years, when it's like essential to have somebody helping you change diapers and be provider. And, you know, when a girl's pregnant, she's got like that horrible need for comfort and neuroticism is pumped through the roof. Yeah, all that, all those beta comfort traits absolutely come in super handy there. But you can't just rely on those because then after the kid turns five, being a dad is no longer essential. It's good to have. And you could, we could argue this, sure. But, you know, dad, a dad is, is what do they call him? Uh, irreplaceable. It's like, really? About half the girls out there have replaced him in less than a year. They leave dad. Dad, get out of here. New dad, come on in. Maybe new dad has kids. Stepbrother, stepsister. Insert some Pornhub premises here. Guy gets some stupid advice. It all goes weird. I don't know. But that's the point. You can't just say men are irreplaceable when I can point out like, and it's not even that it's like a rare example. Like, you know, how a lot of guys love, look at the rock can't even do like, no, everybody knows somebody whose dad was replaced. Everybody. It's like, you don't need to go to celebrities. That's the one thing that always uh, bothers me too. Whenever you hear guys trying to tell you red pill truths or whatever, it's like, dude, if you have to find some crazy celebrity news cycle to prove your point, then it's so rare that you don't need to worry about it. As opposed to something like lung cancer. Any any 80s kid, any 90s kid, any 70s, 60s kid all knows somebody who died from lung cancer from smoking. Everybody. That's why there was no news stories of people dying from lung cancer. Because everybody knew. If it's if it's not rare, it's not news. Uh, Juan Doe, two euro super chat. Hate your kids just a little bit. Nice coach. Well, you don't have to hate them. That's the thing. You just have to accept that. Push comes to shove. Mom can weaponize the kids against you and probably get away with it. Probably. But the beauty of that is girls are kind of feelings brought. They're like they're they're feelings oriented. So if you're the kind of guy who can maintain your role as the hypergamous best option, and a lot of guys are like, oh, but the juice is not worth the squeeze. Like, dude, do you want your family or not? Like, you know what I mean? Everybody is just so adamantly knee-jerk against the smallest bit of effort to achieve your goals. What, I have to appease her? It's like, yeah, a little bit. Same thing as you're on a date. I have to be charming and attractive to get late on this date? It's like, geez, you guys do so much dancing around for women. It's like, do we really? It's like, name one thing in life where you don't have to, like, make an effort at the term set to, to achieve something. It's like, I'll wait. Just being yourself. Yeah. See, Alex is absolutely right in Skyrim and Modern. Being a father is a choice. Simple as. It is. It doesn't make you masculine. And I think a lot of guys, that's a lot of the problems too, when a lot of guys treat it as their identity. I'm going to make a new section for this. Let me just uh, quickly... Uh, yeah, let's give Emily a go. 
And we know that these videos really prey on vulnerable young men who have not had many experiences in dating. And for Jew. Yeah, when a lot of guys make being fatherhood like a virtue, they always use the word masculine, which I, I, the longer I've been in this stupid space and God help me, it's too long already. The more I realize that the term masculinity isn't really a thing. It's like the manosphere. It doesn't really exist. They're marketing buzzwords. The manosphere exists so that you can lump all guys together in a communal thing and make fun of it by using its worst members against it. Masculinity is a way I can sell you trucks. I can sell you trucks and beer and leather by appealing to some weird insecurity that you, you don't have a life that you want to have. And that only works on soft, wealthy, well-to-do people. Like until the middle class became a thing, nobody was ever insecure about their masculinity. They were too busy digging coal <laughs> and farming to worry about Jesus. Is, do these crops make me a man? It's soya bean, but whatever. They're like, no, I'm just going to try not to starve. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. So a lot of guys, they treat these things as identities, as identity markers. And masculinity is an identity marker, which is not good. It's an unhealthy version of narcissism. The reason I know this is because, like here, close your eyes. And when I tell you to picture masculinity, what pops into your head? I guarantee you, you have a bunch of brand visual images. You got a cowboy smoking. You got a guy who's buff and jacked. You got somebody who like chops wood or does something manly that women can't or won't do. Sometimes it's video games. Eh, she can't possibly speed run Minecraft. That's the most mask. But the problem with that is once you're able to like pick these symbols and use those to define the identity, then you just realize it's just a narcissistic fantasy. Not all narcissistic fantasies are about being top G, the best guy in the world stuff. There's a lot of types that you wouldn't expect. Martyrdom is one of those most under underappreciated unhealthy forms of narcissistic identity disorder. You know, where everybody's against me. Everybody's against me. I'm the dutiful plow horse and my wife treats me like, like crap, but I'm staying together because I need to tuck these kids in every night because they need a father in the house. Meanwhile, all they're doing is just arguing why, arguing why they don't get to live a life they want and they have a good excuse to feel okay about it. And then they pick up all these symbols. It's always, you notice that it's always tucking them in at night. Like the kids will not have a healthy life at all if you're not tucking them in. Well, if, if like I never got tucked in as a kid. My girl makes fun of me constantly for that. Anytime where it's like, like for this, she tried to like, let me put the bandage on and help you this. Let me help you this. And I'm like, oh, just get out of here. And she's like, see, this is why you need to tuck them in at, at night. And I'm just like, ah. <laughs> yeah, Johnny needs ba baseball practice. It's got to be baseball. Yeah, Dobros or something else. Friend passed away in our tweens. Had an antique wooden resonator. It belonged to his grandfather. The buddy was virtuoso. Oh, look at that. That's looking neat. So you got to remember, too. Like, if, if somebody is attaching a word to a thing that you're trying to do or an identity you're trying to make to yourself, and you can picture a bunch of symbols that attach to that word, you're basically following somebody's unhealthy narcissism, which interchangeably I could say is just somebody's brand marketing strategy. Cause that's the whole point of marketing is to sell you an identity to tell you uh, to, to stave off an insecurity that they basically invent for you. They basically invent the, the, the insecurity because if I don't tell chicks, you're going to be old and look ugly and nobody's going to love you. Then they're not going to buy my youth defying face cream. Same thing for guys. If I don't tell you, you got to be a real man by joining my war room of masculine excellence then fuck, of course you're not going to buy into it. I got to tell you, you're not a real man. No girl's ever going to fuck you. Your kids are going to hate you and they're going to be raised to be prostitute, you know, drag queens and whatever. There's a reason why a lot of like the conservative branding that you see on Twitter and social media and TV and everything is always about like terrified of the gays and the drag queens. And it's always something that's like, attacking your identity and your identity is always good because you know if it wasn't good then you wouldn't be buying my merch right it's okay guys it's like the girlfriend experience basically prostitution except for tucker, tucker carlson is wearing like instead of wearing lingerie he wears the suit and has that quizzical look on his face like what do you mean 
And then I know when I usually mention this stuff, a lot of guys kind of get, well, he's talking truth. To, and I'm like, yeah, of course he is. That's the problem. If this stuff was just fake and he had to make up a bunch of stuff, it would never fly. But that's the thing. You have to actually have enough truthful statements into it to make it resonate. Tinfoil hattery works the same way. Conspiracy theories. Like if I just tell you, that's why the earth, the flat earth stuff never quite takes off as much as like the 9-11 stuff. Because it's always like, yeah, the Twin Towers fell, the beams do this and do this. And then here's where the lizard people and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But if that first like 40% of the conspiracy wasn't true, you'd never buy into it. Epstein's another great example of that. So you got to be careful. And I know I just said earlier on that, you know, that first 30% of stuff has to kind of make sense where you take that leap to follow the rest of the guy's stuff. So am I not contradicting myself? I'm not. I, am, I mean, I am, but I'm not. The point is, you're never going to know if something is useful or not. Never. You can never know for sure until you try it yourself. But there's certain hallmarks you can use. Yeah, okay. Half of what this guy is saying makes sense. So I'm more inclined to kind of go into the other half. But it's just as likely that that's some tinfoil hattery. You know, the lizard people are why your wife won't fuck you. Or the reason your wife won't fuck you is because you're not doing that. Well, which one is true? Well, at the same time, you just look, which life is better? And this is where like you get, and that's like guys kind of get like these meta mental models. Like you must put this bucket on your head right now. So basically everybody who's like living a good life and then telling you how to live a good life, they have a bucket on their head. They're promising you a good life. So just look at them. Is their life any good? That's one metric you can use. So when you see some tinfoil hattery talking about the lizard people and Epstein or why your wife won't fuck you versus another guy talking about working out and being a servant leader and talking about your feelings versus somebody else who's like, you know, hate your wife a little bit and a lot of the red pill stuff. You look at the results. Like, remember how Rich always says, uh, would you want to trade places with the guy? Which, you know, I'd, it's close. I, I don't think it's quite accurate. I think it's more, do you see the guy living the life that he's preaching about? So when you see a lot of the Tradcon guys, you see a lot of, and you like talk to their wives. Holy fuck. Borderline racist, very controlling, absolutely insufferable to talk to, not pleasant. And when these guys talk about marry up these wives and be the good, you know, sister wife or whatever, and you're just like, really? I'm not buying it. Even though the first half of what they said, yeah, I get it. Like twerking a drag queen in front of your kids, probably not good. I'm, I'm, I'm taking a leap of faith on this one. I don't think that's healthy parenting. <laughs> so you got that. Or you got like the top G stuff, Andrew Tate. Look, I don't really care if you like Andrew Tate or you don't. I People are surprised that I don't really have a strong opinion. Because they're busy watching me at the top of the funnel bait their fans into engagement. Which is so easy. So easy. Like, do you want to live that life? Yeah, you get girls tattooed and Bugattis and all this stuff. Yeah, well, you know. Lung cancer, prison, a lot of notoriety. Like, I don't know. Is this the kind of life you want? Is that really worth it? Is it is an abundance of sexual, like, alpha desirable traits good? Well, it kind of puts you in prison. They always say that. Too much alpha puts you in prison. So you always got to get a balance. So you find, and then I'll use Rolo as the example. He absolutely has some of those, you know, misogynistic tendencies and whatever, like Tate. But he's also got some of the very traditional at-home stuff of, like, for example, like a Matt Walsh. But you look at him, you know, 25 year marriage, happy enough, daughter off to college. Everybody's pleasant. Everybody's nice. He goes fishing. He does his thing. And so this is where I like, like the, you take it just on strict bucket on your head. He's, I don't know. He's kind of living a pretty good life. I wouldn't mind that one. Like I can at least see the stuff that he's talking about. You know, men and women are better off together. It gets there. It makes it. You see the Tate side. Real G's do this. Well, he lost, you know, 33 Bugattis. Couldn't get away. And then you see... The Tradcon guys were crying about, you know, oh, what's his name? Jack Murphy. I was the traditional guy and my wife took the kids and I can't teach baseball practice. So, I mean, you fuck my girlfriend and we'll call it even. She's going to bake some bread for us after. And you're like, all right. But that's the problem is that all three groups of guys, for most people, about half of what they say already resonates with your life. It's that other half, that leap of faith. And again, if you're looking at this through a moral filter... What you're going to see is what you want to see. If you're that frustrated kid who just wants to has like fantasies of power because you watch too many Marvel movies. Yeah, the Tate one, anything he does. Absolutely. That's top G. Anything that goes wrong for him. Oh, that's just the Matrix is after him. And they will follow this stuff because they're looking at it through their moral filter. Same thing as like the traditional conservative, the Catholics, the evangelicals, whatever. They'll look at Matt Walsh, meanwhile, or like Ben Shapiro or whatever. 
Remember his whole thing where it's like, I've never made my wife orgasm. And you're like, oh, okay. And he's bragging about this stuff because sex is only for procreation. I hope, I hope you don't mind my... Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, Sneeko too, yeah. And if you're into that kind of like identity, that narcissistic identity, then yeah, that stuff, you're going to hand wave all the stuff that's wrong. And you'd be like, yeah, most couples... Out, and you'll build a whole bunch of, like, coping strategies. Like, oh, yeah, couples naturally have less sex as they get older. That's just the way it works. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get prostitutes and be hooked on porn. But then you have this game with the wife where porn is cheating. And the guy's like, I have an addiction. And then it's like, no fap or you're going to lose testosterone. And they build up all these little fantastical things that have no attachment to reality. How do you get there? You attach a moral filter to a praxeological idea. And then again, I know I'm cheerleading him a lot today, which everybody's going to, that was always the big critique on me. You're just, you're just here to cheerlead Rolo. It's like, well, I'm not just here for that. <laughs> I'll cheerlead myself quite a bit too. I'll cheerlead anybody if they're not a bag of shit. <laughs> I cheerlead a Doug Chisholm for like 15 minutes here. Oh, I don't even know all these memes. Honestly, I just kind of see like the TLDRs and I'm just winging it. The fact that I get it so close means it's like, it's pretty predictable. Anyways. So you see his, and it's always, like, he's, you know, do rocking thing. He's got the good wife. He doesn't want to cheat on her, anything like that. He still has the, but he still has, like, liquor girls. So he has the pre-selection. He has to be flirting. He has to treat it like a girlfriend-boyfriend thing. Just don't be sexual about it. And so he's able to navigate this with an amoral filter because he knows what he wants as an end goal. I want the liquor brand to take off. I want my book to do well. I want my wife and me to be happy. I want my daughter to be raised and not be a hoe. And he achieves these things. How does he get there? Because he takes morality out of the equation when he's learning how best to navigate things. Uh, Joy Seeker. Thank you very much, sir. BPD free since last Saturday. Dude, congratulations. You ditched her, huh? That was, if I'm not mistaken, that was actually Rolo's uh, uh, zeroing out thing, wasn't it? Where he was dating that BPD chick and she was going to stab him or something. He was going to kill himself or whatever. And he just kind of, at one point he stared at her. Then he stared at the door and he's like, ah, fuck it out of here. Just walked, he walked through that door. And he's like, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> and here we are today. All because of that one stun cunt, you know, but Hey, congratulations. You're crushing it, man. Yeah. Bro Hawk, whatever bucket you put on your head, go ask yourself. Have you been honest about the pros cons willing to accept truth? You can't like that. Self-awareness is hard though, bro. Like I said, joy the reason that he had to do a $20 super chat to say BPD free is because he actually had to bring the self-awareness to know that this is not good for me. Even though as an addiction, BPD chicks are awesome because they, they're like extreme femininity and extreme game. It's like cocaine. Oh, I feel so hyper now. It's like, well, maybe you want a Red Bull. No, Coke. And now he's like, Coke free since last Saturday. <laughs> But yeah, a lot of guys don't see it. And so, yeah, well, you got to be honest with yourself with the pros and the cons. And it's like, that's not how we work. You're riding a high. It's literally endorphins, tons of endorphins. It's like a, it's like a heroin addiction because the girl is fulfilling every one of your male fantasies, that genuine desire. Everybody, oh, you got, you want a girl that gives you genuine desire. Like I've been there. Do you know what girl that gives you genuine desire is, especially early on? Fucking BPD chick. They will act like the perfect waifu trad fantasy slut that's only there for you from like the first week. And you're like, of course, she sees my inner beauty. It's not. It's just she's crazy and she's addicted to falling in love. And it just so happens you're the next mark. And then she's going to get withdrawals soon enough. And then shit's going to go say south. And that's how Carl got stabbed. And that's how Joy Seeker ended up having to be like, I'm out. Fucking jumped off the balcony, landed in the bushes, ran over to watch the podcast through a super chat. He's probably still picking little cedared leaves and thistles out of his mouth. He's like, I'm BPD free boys. <laughs> yeah. Red flags are a green light. Yeah. For fucking that's just it too. That there's an amorality thing. What about casual sex? It's like, well, there's really no other type. Like, what do you want to have robust, like studious academic sex? It's like, no, <laughs> Zagey, where do you guys find these chicks? Ask them for a friend. Numbers, man. Like, keep in mind, bipolar disorder is, well, how, psycholo like, how psychologists and psychiatrists define a mental disorder. They take a certain behavior, narcissism, borderline, bipolar, antisocial, whatever. 
they plot it on a bell curve and they find like out of a hundred people, what kind of what out of the narcissistic traits out of these hundred people or out of the borderline traits out of these hundred people, how many of them do it a little bit or a lot or heavy? And they they have like like a hundred different things that you would do. Like, do you kill cats? Do you do you you know sleep with five six men a year? Like whatever the traits are, whatever the qualities are. And then they kind of count everybody up and they realize most people are within a certain range. That's the middle of the bell curve of borderline behavior. You know, they pick, they mirror the men that they're into. They act, they act affectionate because they want the other person to like them, stuff like that. Okay. So then they find one standard deviation away. People kind of do more of them. And then two standard deviations, people do a lot more of them. And then once you get to the pathological level, which they just define as the third standard deviation, it's literally, it's an arbitrary human line which is good enough because there's a lot of girls that are only borderline to two standard deviations. So not clinically borderline, but functionally, it's hard to tell the difference. Like they're still running roughshod on you. The only difference is they're not taking Ativan or Xanax afterwards. But that's how it's defined. They just take any trait and take the third standard deviation of it, draw a line and say, those people are, those people are damaged. Those people are broken. Uh, give them some pills. That's it. I just broke down psychology for you. And every time I've talked to a shrink on this, they're always like, well, that's overly simplified, but it's like sort of true, which is basically, I like it. You're right. You're not wrong, but I don't like your tone. <laughs> yeah, narcissism is too. And that's why, and that's why I talk about healthy and unhealthy narcissism, because you do need narcissism. It's the, it's the male behavioral disorder in the same way that borderline is the feminine behavioral disorder. But if you guys are just in the middle of the bell curve, yeah, you got, you know, boring guy, but somewhat okay, boring wife, somewhat normal okay, but you guys know the Pareto principle. 80% of guys are in the middle of that bell curve and they're completely invisible to women. So what you want to do is you want to get a healthy level of narcissism and that's like that first standard deviation, parts of the second standard deviation. And then when you see guys like, oh, I don't know, for example, where is he? Boom, what's up fam? Got some big news to share that unfortunately is not so good. So I'm gonna jump right into it. You're gonna watch this video and you're gonna cry. At least we can laugh at your ass as you cry like in, in the corner like a little f***ing girl in the fetal position. When you see this stupid tart <laughs> ranting about being president of the manosphere, that's when you get into that third standard deviation. And that's where people gotta realize like more of something isn't necessarily better. There's a range. Again, from Praxeology Volume 1 Frame, I talk about that, where uh, in the part I was talking about before, where humans aren't designed for objective truth, we're designed to see fitness. The example, and it's a Berkeley professor, the way he describes it as picture like some resource like water. If, uh, if it was linear, in other words, more water is better, then humans would always see more water as better. But we don't. Because, you know, too little water, you dehydrate and die. Too much water, you drowned. So that's not good either. So there's a certain amount of water that you want to have, like lakefront property. But not too much, a waterfall. And humans actually... And he used an example of seeing red as, red as bad, green as good. Red flag, green flag. So you see too little water as a red flag. You see too much water as a red flag. And you see just enough water as a green flag. But that's weird, isn't it? Because that's the same color describing two different things. Yeah, because we're not looking at it from an objective truth lens. We're looking at it through a genetic fitness lens. And it's the same thing here. That's why as a guy, you hate like autistic girls because there's just nothing like butch girls. They're very non-feminine. It's not very fun. You also don't like borderline girls because they're like trying to stab your animals. Terrence Pop had his chick during the divorce, stabbed his fucking dog. So both of those you see as bad. Both of those are red flags. But a girl who has girl game, which for the psychological state of it, I'm defining as like one or two standard deviations of borderline behavior, then you see that as good. So it's always about the fitness level. Same thing as narcissism. A guy who's like a, a sputtering dope who has no identity of his own, not attractive, kind of invisible. Same thing, uh, mega boy over there talking about the president of the manosphere shit, not attractive. But in the middle, there's a guy who thinks of himself as I'm king shit. He's cocky and he's funny, but not to the point that he starts giving himself delusions of grandeur. And that's the healthy level of narcissism. Uh, Wapiti, thank you, sir. $2 super chat. I finished both books on Audible. A plus, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, they're getting, it's getting to be a fun experience uh, making the audiobooks. Not going to lie. I hate 
I hate it because it's like eight hours of talking a day and your voice just thins right out. The one thing that was nice when I caught COVID was for a while there, I was able to like control my larynx and it get, got more gravelly and it, my voice wouldn't thin out as much after a couple hours. I'm like, ah, oh, I should catch COVID before I read the next book. <laughs> but I don't think you can anymore. COVID's over. Yeah. yeah. Every time I think I'm grasping a concept and can handle her, she pushes my buttons like it's nothing. See what I mean? But like Sloth, that's the that's the whole point of the, again, another section of the book. Like you're not there to keep the peace. Girls are going to be unpredictable. They're unpredictable because you don't know their intentions. And their intentions can change. Humans have infinite variability, but where other people get it wrong and they think, well, you can't know anything then, so you shouldn't do anything. It's like, no, you focus on what you can control. And in this case, all you can control is your reactions. So yeah, some chicks are going to be crazy. They are. Can't stop that. Can't change that. One sec. I'm going to make a whole title for this one. Some chicks are going to be crazy makes a nice title. Some chicks are going to be crazy. You can't stop that. But... The thing about this is girls have self-control. I'll use a good example that if there's married guys in here or ex-married guys in here, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Do you ever notice that uh, when your girl's talking about like their mother, they, oh, she's such a bitch. She's angry. She's yelling. She's doing this. She's doing this. And your experience is like, dude, every time I see her, she's on her best behavior, but she's crazy. Just lets you know, even crazy chicks have self-control if they want it, if they really do want it. Uh, Sam Whiskey, $1.99 Super Chat. I am distracted by the comic art behind you, sir. Thank you. This is actually my... Uh, I got these up in Chicago. It's uh, Lichtenstein. We picked up a bunch of Lichtensteins. We were down there. If you know I'm like a big art, art snob. And the pop art and surrealism are kind of... And dataism to an extent, too, are like my favorite artistic movements of modern art. And so we picked those up. Normally they're out in the house, but the girl's doing renos right now. So I just have them in here in the meantime. We're going to get those and the masks back up, so that'll be pretty fun. But thank you, sir. Uh, Jason, $6.99 Super Chat. Agree and amplify, fogging and amuse mastery completely changed my social skills. Anything I watch or read to get better at these skills? It's practice. That's it. Honestly. Um, so if you guys don't know what those are, those are skills from Manuel Smith's When I Say No, I Feel Guilty, and Dr. Robert Glover's When I Say... or uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy, which are... Between those two and the rational and the first year of rational male, I would say that's the trifecta of like, if you haven't read this, you're not red pill in any sense of the word, or you don't know anything about the red pill in any sense of the word. And they were concepts he used on there. It's, it's partially conflict resolution, but I don't want to say that in the sense that your job is to avoid conflict. It's not to avoid conflict. It's not to handle conflict. It's how do you navigate conflict? I think that's a better way of describing it. Conflict navigation. And they put the examples in there, and I've, I, I briefly outline them again in, in Praxeology, because I'm like, synthesize it to something more red pill specific, right? But yeah, there's no more places really to go, and that's the thing. They're, as concepts, they're not super difficult. The issue with those is they require a lot of practice. And so, Jason, I know this is not the answer you want, but it's the real answer. It means it's just a skill you have to practice. It's like anything. Can I read any books on how to be a better pitcher? In baseball, it's like, no, but you got to throw a lot of balls. <laughs> throw a lot of balls. And yeah, I get it. That's a ball joke in there somewhere. Um, I don't remember dare either. I'd have to go look it up, Ben. I know it's what you're talking about. Yeah, never dear, always dare. <laughs> yeah. Still is a kid. That's what makes it so unnerving of being outmaneuvered by a damn teenager. A lot of guys have that problem, by the way. Some chicks are going to be crazy. Now remember, teenage kids, hormones are going through the roof, zero emotional control. And a lot of guys, and I hate to say it, I don't want this to sound sexual because it's not, but they have like one itis for their daughters. And they stop and they stop thinking about their daughters as if they're women. They think of them as if they're kids. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you still have to treat them like any other woman you would. All you got to do is take the, take the sex out of the equation because it's your daughter, you fucking sicko. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when guys realize, like, yeah, it's the same thing. Don't try to fix her emotions. Your job is not to keep the peace. Healthy boundaries, fogging, amuse mastery, agree and amplify, negative inquiry, negative assertion. All these different tools here at the same time. Holding your ground, being attractive. I guarantee you, like, a girl 
looks up like hypergamy. A girl looks up to one man at a time. And until she's got her man and she settled down to relationship stuff, it should be her dad. I mean, he's going to have some fights with the newest boyfriend in that, right? But you always got to, you play it up. You want to be a chick's like hypergamous best option. Because as a dad, you kind of have a, you kind of have a skill set that other people don't have. It's that when a daughter wants validation from dad, she has to get it without using sexuality. Because obviously dad's not going to fall for that shit. And this is like a, it's like a very important skill for women to learn because otherwise you get that situation that Rolo talks about where it's like the only agency a woman has is her sexuality. Well, it's like, yeah, if she's never had to learn to use anything else but her sexuality, then that's all she does have. And how does she learn that? Well, from somebody who doesn't need that, like brothers, fathers, hopefully uncles, but you know, Uncle Touchy is a meme for a reason. <laughs> yeah. And that's where you find a lot of these guys are talking about like like good women and broken women and high quality women and all that shit. A lot of the times it's just girls have horrible issues too. Same as men. You think men are the only ones suffering right now? Girls, yeah. I don't talk about it because I'm not here to fix women. I got one woman that I have a vested interest in fixing any problems from. And it's mine. It took her 13 years to earn that. And for the most part, we wouldn't be here if she had all these problems. So, you know, fuck it. Let them burn. Yeah, see, and Doug, too. My relationship with my daughter's improved after implementing information in this space. That's the one thing I love, and I'm totally off topic on this one, but whatever, fuck it. We're going to end it off on the, the half hour markish anyway. We're going to do a little bit of bants and then grab myself, because I haven't had breakfast yet, and I'm starving. <laughs> starving. Um, yeah, a lot of people find this out. Like, you get to the red pill space. Most of the time, people are here because of, of, of sexual insecurity or sexual, um, a lack of sex life. And then they come in here, they learn some sex stuff, they learn the techniques, the tricks, the stat strategies, the whatever. And then they start having a better sex life, they act more attractive, they get more attractive responses back, they get better sex. And then it's always, I always love the app, like the ripple effects. Everybody's like, dude, I just realized, like, my relationship with my parents is better now. I'm made up with my dad, I got no more daddy issues. Or I'm no longer angry at my mom for being what she was. Or I have a better relationship with my kids. Or I'm making more money at work. And it just, it's like, I, I always call it the the one bait and switch for men that's in their own best interest that exists ever is the red pill and it's just it's nice to see yeah hearing about guys getting their dick wet that's great but hearing about guys who did that and then they did that to like make up with their father before he dies of whatever always good like I, my dad died when i was 18 and i had like we had our moment like our month at the end and it was nice and it was nice that we got like there was no bad blood or anything like that in there and I would just hate for guys, and like I hear all the time about guys who let their their dads pass on without like making that stuff right. And it always kind of sucks. So it's nice to see when guys are doing that with their families before it's too late. <laughs> about lifting. Hey Ryan, I subbed to your channel and got a raise out of nowhere. Is that the curse of red pill? Well, I'm not making it sound like I'm giving you this power like it's fucking Hogwarts, you dumbass. <laughs> fucking guy. You're doing this. It's assertiveness. You just find out that assertive men tend to do better. Assertive men who have attractive qualities tend to do better in life than non-assertive men who aren't attractive and don't have good outcomes. So, welcome. Yeah, will Chomsky be dropping finger nuggets later this afternoon? No, he's got the taste of blood now. I should have been more careful, honestly, because... All right, so, yeah, we're bant. All right, whatever, banter. 130... I'll tell you about I'll tell you about the dog after this, and then we're gonna end the thing. Let me give you a uh Oh the T Rex army. Baby, I love you! Baby! Ah! Sign up, Digital Ryan, greatest channel ever. Yeah, he's the only person in this house with a kill count. And I always make the joke, he's the smallest thing in this house. He's like 13 and a half pounds. He's only got three teeth left. But I remember this back when he was a puppy, he used to fuck around all the time with pit bulls and that and like fearless jumping off of tables that were like four times the height of his. One day he came, he was running around the baseball diamond. He came with a bird in his mouth. He actually caught a bird out of the sky, <laughs> brought it back to us, killed the damn thing as a puppy. So yeah, he's the only thing in this house with a kill count. And everybody always thinks he's like the weak dog with no teeth and all that. But, you know, when push comes to shove, he's got some viciousness to him. And I didn't respect that. And now we have to, have to suffer that. Uh, C Fitness, thank you, sir, for the $20 super chat. Just paying my tuition, coach. Well, hey, according to the chat, I got to celebrate my first super chat from you. Hey, you know what? 
Thank you very much. Like little support, little pieces of support like this are what keep me on the straight and narrow. I will say this. I get it. I get it. A lot of like red pill guys are going clown show. A lot of the girls that are invading the space are going clown show. A lot of them are like, oh my God, did you see what the Kardashians did? I was like, oh, this Instagram thought is whatever. And I, my Manosphere morning is a bit of that, which I get. It's red meat. It's nachos. A little bit of chick talks are like that. I get it. It's red meat nachos, but I always prefer the mids watches. I prefer the podcast here and I prefer, uh, what's the other one I do? Oh, the Patreon where we get in there and it's just boring C-SPAN level work. It's just me sharing some notes with you guys, almost talking about it like a cultural, cultural anthropologist. And then when I see these ones ultimately do well enough it reminds me between that and like when I often get private messages from guys who like can't be associated with the space but are super successful and get some benefit from it. It reminds me like who the real audience is and what they're after and to let as little of the clown show as possible invade this like just enough to reach people, but not so much that we become fucking lol cows, you know, uh, about lifting dot com 50 pesos. I think that's a peso, but thank you very much, sir. Now I feel bad for calling you a dumbass. <laughs> I know we were just fucking with each other, whatever. Yeah, four cuck articles worth of, of, of tuition. That's the worst part of. I don't. I didn't want to talk about the cuck article, but yeah, that's so. If you guys don't know, if you're new to the channel, that's the running gag. Is uh, anything that's in like five dollar super chats will ruin careers. That's Tate yelling at me. That's Jack Murphy yelling at Sydney Watson. So. Most people here are, have like the common courtesy to make it four ninety nine or five oh one or twenty oh one, add a penny to it. But see fitness, there's four heartfelt cuck articles for you, sir. <laughs> Anyways, how much are Canadian pesos now? I don't know, but it boggled, it like blew Nick's mind when I told him we don't have pennies anymore. Uh, all right, let's close this one off. I think that's it for the topics. I don't have much else to add to this one. So I hope you learned a little bit from it. The whole reason why. This space is amoral. The reason why it needs to be amoral, how women invading male spaces tend to remove that benefit and the process of which it happens, as well as the different types of social matrices between men and women and co-ed spaces and how they require different navigational skills. Um, a great little thing here that we got with Doug talking about fatherhood and that. And then what do you do with morality when we have a hard time separating it from the things you're trying to learn? as well as your choices and your virtues and why they suck. And then some chicks are gonna be crazy. So, hope you enjoyed yourself on this one. Let's end with some boba. One of the guys who ran the Red Pill channel sent me a message. I actually appreciate that you took it from an idea-based perspective instead of ever resorting to personal attack. Like, if this movement is actually going to be dangerous, do we need to understand it so that we can take it down? I knew going into it that this might be a hot mess. I'm not gonna have those guys back on my channel again, absolutely not. So, uh, well, the erudite ones, you guys thought that was the first feminist I fucking debated? No, man. Uh, Tyler Pelton, $4.99 super chat. Dude, thank you so much. I hate talking about the cuck article. <laughs> and simply too awesome. 10 British pounds. That's too heartfelt. The fuck is wrong with you? Heartfelt. Not talking about the cuck article. <laughs> I didn't hurt it. The dog hurt it. And yeah, Wapiti, just got here 25 minutes ago. We'll be rewatching your East Coast early bird. I wish I wasn't, man. I really wish I wasn't. The military ruined me. I wake up at 6. That's it. And then some days I wake up early, like at 4.30. I, I feel like Jocko Willenick, except for I don't want to be. Anyways, enjoy yourself. <laughs> we're going after this. I've got a, a raid, so we're going to go to Rolo's channel. Uh, I guess... Oh, yeah. Uh, so this is the thing. I guess the newest thing is like uh, with the, the playing with fire guy and... Abba and Preach and, I don't know, a whole bunch of, the, like, the young bucks trying to show off how awesome they are. These guys are 40 years old. They don't know about dating. They're fucking out. And so we're going to be there running some motherfuckers up the flagpole. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. So on that one, I'll catch you guys later. Seventy nine T twenty four fifty eight learning corp little red riding hood take one. Uh -huh.